Well, today I get to introduce you to a, a text that, that could be a, a friend for many years uh, to come. It is a, a, a text which is frequently described as one of the most uh, beautiful Christian remains of the uh, earliest phase of the church, the, the generation immediately after the, the Bible was uh, written and composed uh, from the generation that we've been talking about with Polycarp and Ignatius, uh, men who uh, knew uh, the apostles directly, uh, people who were eyewitnesses to the immediate eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection and his, his death and his life. Uh, but this uh, text stands out for some of its, its literary qualities. Uh, it is also, as we'll, we'll discuss, uh, arguably the first apology written in the church's history. Not the first apology given. Uh, you see that, of course, in, in the book of Acts. You, you see apologies. Um, in Christ's own uh, testimony, you see apologies. Uh, but rather, uh, this is the first uh, literary remain uh, of the church after the, uh, the scriptural witnesses themselves. Uh, the picture I, I've put up there is uh, almost unrelated to the letter. It's a statue, I think, artfully composed there, half in shadows, half in light, very much like uh, the man. Uh, that's the emperor Marcus Aurelius. That's a, a statue of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, and he's in the frame here uh, because uh, there's a statue of him and there isn't of Diognetus because we, we don't know uh, who Diognetus or Diognetus, depending on how you like to pronounce it, we don't know who he is. The connection with uh, Aurelius is that uh, his tutor was named Diognetus. And so uh, some people have suggested that the choice of uh, Diognetus as a, uh, the person to whom this text is addressed is meant to suggest that it was sent to the Emperor Marcus Aurelius's long time, very well acknowledged, very famous uh, instructor in Stoicism. And uh, Marcus Aurelius is an interesting guy. You can read Marcus Aurelius today. He has a wonderful book called The Meditations, which is a, a very important source of uh, our knowledge of Stoicism, the philosophy of Stoicism, uh, which is a, a very uh, powerfully expressed uh, and important ethical philosophy in the history of the world that in some of its aspects uh, shares some things with Christianity and its approach to, to ethics. And so Christians have often uh, reached out to Stoics, reached out to similarities between Stoic ethics and Christian ethics uh, to suggest that uh, there was a point of conversation uh, between the two. In any case, if that's, if that's what's happening here, uh, the letter is addressed to a well-known Stoic philosopher who is the tutor, the, the educator of the emperor. And he's in shadow because Marcus Aurelius uh, was also a, a very great commanding general, very bloody uh, general, uh, who made important conquests in Germany. Uh, but he was also a great persecutor of Christians. He, he, he launched a, a persecution of Christians. And as we see in the letter, I've bolded the aspects where it says uh, that this is a letter written during a time of persecution. It, this is a letter that is, is written during a time of persecution, and so it certainly fits this, this designation. Now, I said that arguably... The PowerPoint, it points, but it doesn't power. <laughs> there we go. I said that, that arguably this is the first apology. And uh, the word apology is a perfectly good Greek word, uh, apologia. Uh, it comes from the word apo and logos. And it, it can be used as a, a legal term, in which case it is the, the term that we would use for the defense it is what the defense puts on, is the Apollo Liga. Uh, and that is uh, the structure here. It's the account, the logos, the account, the argument against Apo. So there's the, the prosecution or the plaintiff has gone first, and they've given their logos. 
why, why am I here? Why do I deserve some remedy? Why should this person be put in jail? And then the defense gives their apo, their apologia. So this is a, an account after the initial attack has been, has been made. It's a perfectly good uh, Greek word, as I say. I'm not sure the word apology is a very good English word, uh, it, at least not in a, a, a culture which is highly attuned to Greek meanings, because apology today means something you say as uh, an acknowledgement that you've done something wrong. I, I apologize for stepping on your foot. I apologize for hitting your car. Uh, that's what an, an apology is. And that has nothing to do with uh, the word apology as it's used in this context. An apology is a specific form of, of writing that we find in the, the days of persecution and up to today, when people who are under persecution respond, respond to a very particular thing. Now today, the word has a, a broader meaning, which just means a particularly a kind of philosophical defense of Christianity and an argumentative defense of Christianity. A, a, perhaps if you were going to criticize it, a rationalistic defense of, of Christianity. Uh, that's a fine meaning to know, that it means any philosophical argument defending Christianity against opponents of Christianity. But there's a biblical meaning that I'm referring to, which again is grounded uh, in persecution and suffering. And I want to unpack that meaning because it's older and it's, it's fundamental to what we're doing here. So uh, the word apologia ap appears in the Bible in uh, Peter, in the first letter of Peter, uh, chapter 2. And it, it begins, as you see on the screen, in a discussion of different groups and how they might suffer persecution for their Christian faith. Uh, slaves, it says. This is, we get to slaves eventually. Slaves, submit yourselves not only to those who are good, and considerate, not only to masters who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. The very uh, interesting thing to do is to say, slaves, take heart, because the way that you respond even to an unjust master with submission, if it's done for the sake of God, is actually referred to God. It is actually in obedience to God. You, you can act under an unjust master, or if you're working in, a, in a, a law firm, or if you're working for anybody, an unjust employer, you can act with regard to them, not simply in the situation that you feel trapped in, but you can be gentle, submissive in response to them as a way of being aware of God. If you suffer for doing good and you endure it, not suffer for doing bad, mind you, suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called. This is a way of being with Jesus Christ. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. So this is part of our general theme about martyrdom, suffering, witness, when you respond to injustice against you and you suffer for the sake of God, you suffer to be like God, you are participating in Christ's sufferings. You are doing what he did. You are following after him. You are, are drawing your mind and keeping your mind on, on God. So then we get to, to this passage a little bit later. The discussion continues. And here we get the notion of an apologia introduced. Again, even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Hard to believe, I know. This, this is the kingdom of God bursting into the world. Who is blessed when they suffer? Well, those who are with Jesus Christ when they suffer. Who are blessed when they suffer? Those for whom Christ's suffering flows out from his life into ours, and who by that very suffering are assured that they are members of Christ's body, that they are one with Jesus Christ, and that if they are one with Jesus Christ, they are one forever in his resurrection, in his eternal life, in his kingship. 
If you suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Don't fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. That is to say, when a king comes to me and makes me suffer, I set him apart as Lord. You know why? Because he's making me suffer. I don't want to suffer. I'm fighting against him. And he asserts his lordship over my body and makes me suffer. When I'm thrown in jail, the jailer is set apart naturally in my heart as Lord. When someone comes and coerces me and does something cruel to me, my natural tendency is to say, that is my Lord, because he can force me to do things I would never choose. That's the natural way. But the way of Jesus Christ is not to be frightened, not to fear what they fear. When you suffer, at that moment, say, Jesus reigns, Jesus is Lord. Here I am, I'm being just, and I'm suffering. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is ruling right now. That's hard to do. Jesus loves you. Jesus is good. Jesus reigns right now when I suffer. How so? In the same way that God reigned when Jesus Christ suffered. You're following after his example. This is a, a moment where the triumph of God is occurring where through your suffering, the power of the kingdom of God is shown, because you do not live for this moment. You live eternally with Jesus Christ. You have your reward already in heaven, and you show by the power of your joyful endurance of suffering in doing what is good, your faith, your conviction, your knowledge of the kingdom of heaven. To set apart Christ as Lord while you're suffering is to say, I deny the world's claim. I deny Pontius Pilate's claim that he's in control. I say that my father is in control. And in saying that my father is in control, I can even embrace this moment as a moment of triumph in Jesus Christ. Now, some of you may have been saying, of course, by suffering, by willingly undergoing suffering, I can show my faith that I have eternal life in Jesus Christ by not despairing in suffering, by even rejoicing in suffering as the scriptures teach us. But is that all you can do? You can show forth your faith in the kingdom of God without words, as the people did in the Colosseum when animals were devouring them. They didn't have a time to give a speech. But is there a, an opportunity to say something too? And the answer is of course. Like Stephen, uh, when he was a witness for Jesus Christ, uh, he gave a great speech. So too, uh, Peter says, in this moment of suffering, when you are suffering and setting apart Jesus Christ as Lord, always be prepared to give an apologia. Always be prepared to give an apologia. To everyone who asks you for the hope that you have. What reason do you have for the hope? So notice the, the structure here. They ask you a question about your hope. Why are they going to ask you about your hope? Because you're in prison and you're not despairing. Because you're sentenced to death and you're rejoicing. Because you are, are suffering for doing what is good. They know that they're being unjust to you. They know that they're being unfair to you. They know that they're hurting you. They know that they're starving you. They know that they're humiliating you. And yet your reaction is not the reaction of the world. You've set Jesus Christ apart as your Lord, and you're acting like this is part of God's plan. You're acting like this doesn't end in death, this doesn't end in humiliation. You're looking like this is part of your victory in Jesus Christ. You're filled with hope. I'm torturing you. You're filled with hope. I've just denied you a job. You're filled with hope. I'm making you do something I shouldn't make you do. And you're filled with hope? Why? What reason do you have for your hope? And your answer is, Jesus Christ. I'm righteous in Jesus Christ. I'm not righteous in myself. I'm righteous in Jesus Christ. He's paid my debts. He has given me eternal life. What's happening right now is not the result of your will and your plan and your ideas. You bear that responsibility with respect to God. I know that what Jesus is working out in my life right now is for my good and part of his eternal reign in heaven. That's what an apologia is in the biblical sense. 
It is a response to a response. The first response is someone sees that you are being hopeful in persecution. That's the first response. I see that you're being hopeful in persecution and I say, why are you being hopeful in persecution? I'm persecuting the heck out of you. I'm doing a great job here. Why are you so hopeful? And you say, I'm hopeful. This is the apologia. I'm hopeful because of Jesus Christ. The condition for making a biblical apology is that you have shown hope in a time of unjust suffering. Now, as I say, there's a modern concept of apology, which just means I'm responding to people who have attacked Christianity. It particularly refers to philosophical, rational argumentation. But I think that's a weak and a thin concept compared to the biblical concept. The biblical concept is much more robust. It has much more to do with the, the faithful life of Christians. An apology is what you do after you have suffered and triumphed so mightily that someone says to you, because of your justice, because of your righteousness, you're, you're poor, you're humiliated, you have, you have lost, why are you smiling? Why are you rejoicing? How, how can you be hopeful? How can you... Why do you persist in good deeds? Why do you persist in loving each other? Why do you rejoice when other people don't? And then when you say, because my joy is not in this body of death. My joy is not in what is passing away in any case. My joy is in an eternal righteousness I have by the blood of Jesus Christ that is my guarantee that I live forever in his resurrection. In any case, uh, the letter to Diognetus is of the biblical kind of apology. If it's an apology, it's of the biblical order because it's a response to a response. The, the letter is addressed to Diognetus, and it's a response to questions. And the, the questions are interesting questions. One of the questions is, uh, why do you Christians not worship Greek idols? Or why don't you in engage in Jewish sacrifices, Jewish holy days, Jewish observances in, in temples? Another really great question to see, why are you guys so peculiar in the way that you love each other? Why are, why are you so... Uh, philanthropic is actually the Greek word. The Greek word there is, why are you so philanthropic to each other? Why do you show such a love of humanity in each other? But this is, I think, the, the core of the question that's motivating this. What is it about the God that you believe in? What is it about the, the form of religion? Religion is simply the, the way in which you fulfill your duties of worship to God. What is it about your God? This is, this is Diognetus saying this. What is it about your God? What is it about your way of worship that lets you look down with contempt upon the important things of this world and despise death? Because here we are throwing you to the lions, as we'll see later in the, in the story. We're throwing you to wild animals. We're taking your property. We're seizing your houses. We're taking away your places of worship. We are beating you. We are torturing you. We are killing you. And yet you rejoice. How is it? What's up with this God you worship that makes you do that? So this is, this is a response. This is a response to a response. The initial response, the response of Diognetus is wonder at the way Christians respond to persecution. What is it about the God you believe in and the form of religion that you observe that lets you look down on the things of this world? Everybody hates you. The Jews say you're, you're foreigners. The Greeks persecute you. And yet those who hate you can't assign a normal reason for their hate because you're not violating any of the basic norms of society. You're not killing. You're not dishonoring your parents. 
You're not stealing, you're not lying, you're not coveting, you're not committing adultery. The regular rules by which all societies run, you're not violating, and yet everybody hates you. And when we see the way you suffer, we wonder, what is it about your God? I just wanted to give you a real-world example of this going on, this kind of, of, of persecution going on in the world right now. Uh, this, I think this came out about two weeks ago. Uh, the chairman of the National Committee of the Three Self-Patriotic Movement in, in China, the organization that's responsible for uh, running the, the state uh, churches in China, the, the Catholic Church, the, the Protestant churches there, was giving a speech in the National Assembly in, in China. You can watch it on YouTube. If you just type his, his name in, uh, you can watch this speech on, on YouTube. I recommend it. It's a very interesting speech. And he attacked uh, the churches for uh, Western influence, the Protestant churches for Western influence. We must recognize that the Chinese churches are surnamed China, not the West. Some believers lack national consciousness, and that's why we have the saying, one more Christian, one less Chinese. And this is about what, what uh, Diognetus has said. The Jews are attacking you because you're not Jews. You're, you're foreigners. Once you become a Christian, you're a foreigner. The, the Greeks are unsettled by you because you don't follow our, our customs. We have customs. Everyone in the state sacrifices to the state gods. Uh, the, the leader here uh, is also very concerned about, about customs. In modern times, Christianity was spread widely to China along with the colonial invasion of Western powers and therefore called a foreign religion, Zhu said on Monday, striking a nationalist tone to underline the need for Sinicization to make the country more, more Chinese. That's, of course, an interesting claim, given that the father of the Chinese uh, nation, the man called the father of the Chinese nation, Sun Yat-sen, was a, a Christian who learned his nationalism in uh, Hawaii at an Anglican school, where he was taught the, the model of Hebrew nationalism in the Bible as a paradigm for all nations. And when he returned to begin the process of liberating China, did not attempt to liberate it from uh, Western influence, but of course from the influence of the Manchu. The dynasty that he was trying to overthrow as a foreign influence was not Western, but he came bearing his faith as a Christian, baptized as a, a congregationalist in, in Hong Kong, uh, and uh, opposed uh, the Manchu, the, the Mongolians. Sorry, Professor Collier. The Mongolians, not, uh, not the, the Anglicans who had taught him uh, the, the, the Christian faith. But in any case, uh, according to the five-year plan to sinicize Protestant churches, Released by the Chinese authorities, efforts to make the faith more Chinese included a new translation and annotation of the Bible. Uh, this is very much like the, 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 the project of the King James Bible, by the way. Um, King James, when he wanted to solidify the, the state religion, uh, commissioned a Bible. And he commissioned it against the Geneva translation of the Bible, which was viewed as disfavoring the kingship. He wanted a, a translation of the Bible that would be more, more favorable to the Anglican establishment. Uh, so they're, they're following so far the Anglican line here. It also demanded Chinese traditional culture be integrated into the, the liturgy. Uh, the more sacred, mu sacred music, clerical clothing, and church buildings using traditional Chinese tunes to compose hymns. I think I could probably, I could probably get behind some of these and encouraging Christians to practice calligraphy and Chinese painting. These sound like good ideas to me. I favor Chinese calligraphy and Chinese painting. Um, probably I would agree on some of the musical selections as well. I don't know. Uh, the only thing objectionable about some of these things is that the state is forcing them. I recognize all of these disputes because um, my forebears in England had the same fight with the English government. 
They wanted particular tunes to be sung in church. They wanted particular national outfits to be used. The, the, the priests to dress like English priests have always dressed. They wanted only the authorized version of the Bible. The King James Version is the authorized version. They wanted only the authorized version to be used in churches and taught to, to people. They wanted only the official hymns to be sung that celebrated English culture. I recognize all of these things. And there was a great debate in England between those uh, like the Puritans who said the state may not dictate to us what we do in churches and those who said, no, these things are indifferent. The state can tell us what, what songs to sing and what version of the Bible to use as long as it's, it's accurate. And other Christians said, nope, we're going to America because we're not going to put up with the state telling us to do these, these things. This is a, a very old fight is my problem. It's not just limited to China. The question of the relationship of religion and uh, nationalism is a very old fight indeed. And uh, what's happening in China right now does not just consist of this oppression, but as you, as you may know, right now there is a huge wave of church closures going on in China. The, the, the government is engaged in a massive crackdown against Christians. Uh, what we're talking about here when we talk about persecution is happening today on an unrivaled scale, perhaps, in human history in, in China, uh, as well as many other places in the world, particularly in the Middle East, where there's been a genocide of, of Christians uh, from many of the most ancient places where, where Christians live. Well, not only was it, is it an issue uh, in the days of of England on, in the Reformation, or today in, in China. It's, it was also a big issue in, in the days of uh, Diognetus. Remember, this is one of the questions. Who are you guys? What's the deal with you Christians? Why does everybody hate you so much? What are you doing that's irritating people? And uh, he writes, our author here, who's anonymous, he just calls himself Mathetes, which means the disciple. He writes, he says, well, we Christians are not distinguished from other men by our nation. We're not like the Jews. We're not a, a particular line of blood. We're not a nation. We don't have a special language. We, we don't have special customs that we observe. We don't in, inhabit particular cities of our own. We don't have a particular form of, of speech. We don't lead a way of life that's marked out by any other kind of particularity. But inhabiting all cities, Greek cities, non-Greek cities, according as the, the lot, God's providence has appointed people to be born either Greek or barbarian, to live here or there, following the customs of the native citizens in respect to clothing, food, and the rest of their ordinary conduct, Nevertheless, Christians display to us a life that is wonderful and striking, but not against any nation, not in a way that opposes them to any nation, not in a way that, that means they can't conform with national customs. Their, their way of, of a striking mode of life is within their national identity, within their place, within their time, within the customs in which they find themselves. And the, the point of contrast here is with the Jews and the Greek philosophers. Greek philosophers had their own clothes. Uh, they, they had their own educational system. They set themselves off from society. Uh, the Jews, of course, did likewise. They had their own way of dressing. They had their own way of eating. They had particular customs. They were a nation apart from other nations. And he's saying, we're not like the philosophers and we're not like the Jews. We are not distinguished because we're trying to change your national customs. It, it's just a ridiculous lie that the, the Chinese official there is, is saying when the, the birth of Chinese nationalism comes directly and unassailably through Christian influence into China via Sun Yat-sen and an enormous wash of other Chinese nationalists who were directly reflecting Christian teaching about the rights and existence of, of nations to claim that Christianity came into China as an anti-Chinese cultural force. It manifestly didn't. The, the, the basis of the Chinese uh, resistance to the foreign domination of their large country by the, the Mongolian minority 
uh, came about through Christian leaders. And you could find that in a number of different countries in the world where it was precisely those who had a Christian education who were most interested in saying uh, nations have real rights and real identities that can be vindicated against imperial authority or uh, ethnic minorities who have taken over a, a country, as in the case of, of China. And this teaching that Christians are not importing a universal culture into all lands it goes back to the very beginning. This is one of the earliest pieces of Christian theology. You miss the point. We, we aren't trying to import foreign customs and culture. That's not how we, we do it. Here's how we distinguish ourselves. Christians dwell in their own countries. The Greek word here is fatherlands. In their own nations. They, 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 they are at home in their own fatherland. But they dwell there as sojourners. That is to say, as visitors. Why? Because like Abraham, you dwell in the promised land looking for the land that is to come. You dwell in your homeland, but you dwell there as a stranger looking for the eternal king that you are, kingdom that you are to inherit. You live as citizens. You're a citizen. You accept the, the burdens of citizenship. They share, this is a, means in this, the Greek word here means, they share in the contribution to all things. They pay their taxes. They do their, their civil service. They are happy to share the burdens of, of citizenship. And yet, they're willing to go beyond that and endure all things as foreigners. They marry, as all others do. They have children. This is unlike certain of the philosophical groups which said you shouldn't marry, you shouldn't have children. They marry, they beget children, but they don't have abortions. They don't expose their children. They have a common table, which means they're hospitable. They let people come in and share their food but they don't have a common bed. Romans at this period of time were famous for sharing their, their wives, but not for their hospitality. It was a sick and degenerate culture that they were living in. They're in the flesh. They have bodies, but they don't live after the flesh. They pass their days on earth, but here's the reference to Paul, but their citizenship is in, in heaven. They obey the prescribed laws. I think the, the translation here is a little weak. The Greek word here is nakau, which means to conquer. That's where the word victory comes from, Nike. They obey the prescribed laws, and at the same time, they conquer, overcome, surpass the laws by their lives. I would love it if someday someone would say that about all of us that they, they taught people how to overcome, surpass, conquer the unjust laws uh, in, their, in their lives. They are evil, oh, they, are, they, they love all men, and they are persecuted by all. Now we, we see the passage to the explanation of persecution. They love all men and are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death but restored to life. They are poor, yet make many rich. They are in lack of all things, and yet they abound in all. They are dishonored, and yet in their very dishonor, they are glorified. Now he's getting to the question, which is you're wondering about the way Christians act in persecution. He's introducing him to the biblical theology that we've talked about before. The center unavoidable part of what the Bible teaches about the Christian life is that your response to suffering should be different than the world's. Because you see in your suffering a participation in Jesus Christ. You, you see in your suffering not a confirmation that you have lost all, but that a confirmation that you have unity with Jesus Christ in his sufferings. They are evil spoken of, and yet they are justified 
They are reviled and they bless. They are insulted, but they repay insult with respect, courtesy, honor. They do good, and yet they are punished as evildoers. He's quite obviously referring to the letter from Peter here. He's, he's going through the aspects of the letter to, to Peter. He knows he's making an apology. He's reciting the conditions for making an, an apology. You have asked, and let me just remind you, you have asked about how we respond to persecution in a marvelous way. Let me remind you how we do it. When punished, they rejoice as if they were dead and they have been quickened, restored to, to life. My friends, that's a, an extraordinary uh, description of the way Christians behave. And you may very well think it doesn't match what Christians do today. Shame on us. Because that's the, the biblical witness of how Christians are supposed to behave. It's like he just went through the scriptures and pulled out uh, what it is you're supposed to do. Jesus says, blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you, when they insult you, when they reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. That's the, the basic thing that's made Diognetus wonder. In the day when you are insulted, beaten, scorned, killed, you rejoice. Leap for joy. You think I'm overplaying this? Rejoice. Leap for joy. I don't do much leaping. But in the, in the day of persecution, leap for joy. Because in that day, your reward is established in heaven. If you want to know what it looks like in the Bible, Acts 540, they called the apostles in. And they, they used straps of leather to rip the flesh from their backs. To, to rip apart their bodies with straps of leather that were accelerating at speeds faster than the speed of, of sound. That's why they make that nice popping notion. They flogged them, and then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing, bleeding, friends, bleeding, limping. They left rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of God. If you're wondering, in an unjust and fallen world, where there are unjust laws, where there are unjust people, where there are terrible things going on, where if you say that you're a Christian, it may hurt you in some ways, if you're wondering in, in the world that we face whether you can nevertheless glorify God, the answer is absolutely. When, when you live for God, when you draw persecution down upon yourself because you are, are living for the name of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and you suffer for it, you absolutely can rejoice because you are glorifying God in that moment. A little more scripture. In case you're wondering whether you should anticipate this in your life as a Christian, you should. 1 Peter 4. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. You participate. Participation, uh, the Greek word is, is uh, metathexis there, and it, it means somebody who shares something. You are you are united. It's a form of, of, of unity. You are united and conjoined with somebody. You participate in Christ's sufferings. The Bible also talks about Christ's sufferings overflowing the bounds of his life into our life. It's not your suffering by yourself. You're participating in Christ's sufferings. They're not really your sufferings. What's happening is you are participating in Christ's sufferings. Why? 
Because the only way to be united in Jesus' resurrection is eternal life in his rule is to be united in his sufferings. You may think that you're the Christian who has the, the golden pass that keeps you from having to suffer like Jesus Christ suffered. There are no such golden passes. It is, that, is, that is not biblical. There is no golden pass mentioned. There is no exception given. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. Why? Because God is with you. Because then the Holy Spirit rests upon you. So three things this passage teaches us. We should anticipate suffering if we're Christians. When we suffer, we're not alone. We're actually united with Jesus Christ in a special way. We are participating in his sufferings. They're not really our sufferings, exactly. We are participating in his sufferings. And the Holy Spirit rests on us in a particular emphatic way, a way that we can know. The Holy Spirit is always everywhere, but we can be aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit in that, in that moment. Remember, this is a way of conquering. This is the way in Revelations 12 that those who witness, those who die as witnesses for Jesus Christ are, are described. They overcame the enemy. They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Because they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. It's hard to say this, but you ought to want, you ought to anticipate so clearly the wonder of the presence of the Holy Spirit the honor of participating in the sufferings of Christ, the fact that this is a prophecy, that when you suffer, you should feel joy. I know it's hard to say that you want to suffer. And in one sense, of course, you don't want to suffer. I understand that. I don't think Paul here is denying that. But this is a very simple and powerful biblical uh, test for you and where you are. Can you say this? with Paul. I want, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship, the participation in his sufferings. Do you, do you want to know fellowship with Jesus Christ? Do you want to know the fellowship of his suffering? Paul says, I want to know the fellowship of sharing in the sufferings of Jesus Christ, even to becoming like him in his death. But of course you can say that. If you can also rejoice in your sufferings. Again, Paul, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. Do you want to be an, a, an apologist for the Christian faith? Do you want to be the, the person who speaks a great defense for the Christian faith? Like uh, the anonymous person did in this letter to Diognetus. It's very beautiful. It gets more and more beautiful. Read the whole thing sometime. It's wonderful. It could be a lifelong friend, as I, I said to you before, uh, this great anonymous figure who wrote the, the letter. Do you want to be an apologist? Do you want to be the person who, who stands up and explains why the attacks on the Christian faith are, are wrong? Well, it, it's a response to a response. First, you'll be honored to share, to participate, not to suffer yourself. You will be honored to suffer like Jesus Christ. You will share in his sufferings. And in that day, you'll rejoice. Why? 
Well, Paul says, we rejoice in our sufferings. Not because we like pain, not because we like to be poor, not because we like to be dishonored. That's silly. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that the suffering that comes from a righteous life in Jesus Christ produces perseverance. It builds me up. Perseverance, character. It becomes a, a formed part of who I am. And a man with character, a man who becomes more and more of a man, a woman who becomes more and more of a, a woman in Jesus Christ, has hope. What is the, the distinctive aspect here? Paul says it ends in hope. And that is what makes people wonder. That's what makes people ask you a question. Your response to my persecuting you has been hope. What do you know that I don't know? I've just taken your house. I've just closed down your church. This is what the Chinese authorities are doing to Christians right now. I've closed down your church. I've demolished it. I have lowered your, your social credit score so you can't travel, so you can't open a bank account. I, I have marked you, and unless you do what I say, you don't get to participate in the economy like everybody else. I've taken away your job. I've limited your travel. I may just throw you in jail. And yet you're rejoicing. You're persevering. You become quite the character. You are filled with, with hope. What is it that makes you so hopeful? Now, my friend, when you give your response to that question, now you are an apologist. Now you answer out of the love that God has poured into your heart by the Holy Spirit whom God has given to you. Rejoice in suffering? Of course. Not because we like pain, but because unity with God is our religion. The answer that the, uh, the man is given is the reason we act like this is because our religion isn't an invention of man. It's not a matter of the flesh. It's not something that we, we, we put in veils where we don't know God. Our religion is God himself in us, living in us, directing us, encouraging us, giving us hope. So the, the conclusion of this is, is I think, uh, twofold. The letter from Diognetus is a, a excellent biblical example of the form of an apology. The author and his community, they have suffered and they have triumphed. They have not suffered and become bitter and unhopeful. They have suffered and abided in the life of the Holy Spirit within them so that they draw forth from other people exclaimed questions. What's up with you guys? What's the reason for your hope? The reason for our hope is that we know God. We know him inside of us. We know him in his kingdom to come. We know him in eternal life. And we know him in righteousness. We are not a threat to you in your nations, in your languages, in your customs. We only want to take those nations, those customs, uh, those countries and bear more burdens, obey more laws. We want to do everything that you're doing and then some more. We want to honor our marriages. We want to honor our commitments. We want to stop stealing. We want to stop cheating. We want to stop lying. We want to do everything you want us to do. The only thing that we're asking is that we be allowed to acknowledge the kingship of Jesus Christ, to say it. Yes, I obey you. Jesus is king. Yes, I obey you, but I obey God first. And what he has demanded of me is not a disruption to your kingdom, your language, your culture. It is goodness in all circumstances. If you do those things, you will be persecuted. And so we can ask in our own day, if we say we're not a persecuted church, well, then we should ask, are we an obedient church? 
Are, are we really living in the power of Jesus Christ? Are we really thriving in the power of Jesus Christ? If we are a persecuted church, rejoice. Friends, there are persecuted churches in the world today. The church is, as a whole is undergoing persecution in the world today. The church in the Middle East has basically been annihilated within the last 20 years. While, while people talked about this and that and the other thing, while people in, invested in new forms of, of commerce and technology and patted themselves on the back about creating human rights for men to go into female showers, while there is a genocide going on and we did nothing, there's, there's persecuting going on right now in China. And while Apple and Google and the other econo-fascists are plotting to make money, extracting whatever they can from the Chinese economy, while they are patting themselves on the back about regulating speech on the internet, they are doing nothing to stop an actual persecution happening in China. There is persecution in the world today. There is no remedy for it. The prophecy of Jesus Christ about what will happen to his faithful is being carried out in the world today. If you live as Christians, you will face persecution. Death? No, not John wasn't killed. Do I know exactly how you'll be persecuted? I don't. There are many ways you can be persecuted. There's dishonor, there's insults, there's loss of jobs, loss of incomes. There's all sorts of difficulties you can have in, in life. But you will be. And if it doesn't happen exactly to you, it's happening to your body right now. The church of Jesus Christ is, is bleeding and suffering, and you ought to feel its pain. Make sure that we bring offense on ourselves, not through it attacking the, the, the cultures of the world, but through our righteousness. Because if you are persecuted for righteousness sake, in that day, you can rejoice. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we repent, Lord, of the ways that we have turned aside to avoid a complete witness to your name. We repent, Lord, of the times in our lives when to avoid following you and incurring the wrath of, of man, we have denied your name. And just like Peter, Lord, denied your name, but repented and became a witness of your resurrection, we pray, Lord, that we may be witnesses of your resurrection, that we may give a true testimony to the truth, and to the righteousness which we know in Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.